Yeah, there was uh, Guardians 3. Don't, I don't care. Uh, a second Mario one. Indiana Jones. Uh, Transformers, I didn't see that one either. There, people were telling me about it, but I thought it was a Netflix one at first. No, it's another live action one. Yeah, um, I'll be okay. I'm just saying. Well, we'll talk about trailers later in the show proper. Are you doing well, Jay? Proper. How was the, how was the backlash to last week's show where we had the revelation that you don't hate toys? I was great. <laughs> I hate him again, though. I'm, I'm off toys. <laughs> I figured I, it was going to be a short-lived window where you you embrace them, and now not. I don't like comic books either. Music probably is going to be next week, so we'll see how it goes. You put the guitar down. You're done with the. You're done with the tunes. That's how. It goes. No, I'm not done with the tunes. I just hate music. Oh, Although, what happened in the world of music that you hate now? Oh, nothing. I'm just kidding. Oh. I liked uh, Alexi Tuna. The new Metallica song is really good, actually. Uh, Luxi Turna? Is that what it's called? Uh, I think he says Lexi Tuna in the chorus, but... Lexi Tuna! You, yeah. Did you like it? Oh, I loved it. Yeah. I like, hated it. I loved it. It was... Oh. It felt so stock. I, it felt like they wrote it in Pro Tools. It's like, well, here's where we're going to put this riff. And then we better have a riff here. And then we better have a riff here. Oh, this yeah. is where the Metallica solo goes. So we got to do this. It just, it felt like a, a discarded session from Kill em All, but written in 2022. Well, for, for me, given the track record that I haven't liked anything since Black Album, I'll take it. At least had some kind of That's not true. melody. That is not true. What's not true? You you like you have liked certain songs and parts of songs from Metallica after the Black Album. Oh yeah, it's pu- it's pushing it though. It's pushing it. You know, <laughs> it's, it's like, like love for toys. It's like um, Metallica oh, post Black Album is akin to <laughs> windowless packaging on Hasbro. <laughs> it's pushing <sighs> it. You might get a figure you like, but you don't feel comfortable buying it. Yeah, I, I definitely give it. I give it a shot, and, and as the albums go on and the years go on, I give it less of a shot and less of a shot. But I mean, just you know, bands they change their sound, and I don't have any problem with that. Um, you know, you could tell when James finally started to actually sing, and that's when I think he lost a lot of the old school fans like me. But it's really all about the the melodies, and I just none of the melodies they've created in the last 20 years. I I really liked. So it just doesn't feel organic. It doesn't feel like there's four guys in a room and they're jamming on a song. And here, this is the song. This feels like I've brought these riffs. You play something here. Let's record it and figure it out in the studio. Like it doesn't feel like it's people playing music together. It feels like, well, it's, it's not, it's James's show. With Lars's well, comments, it's always been that way, and it will it's always, always be been that James way. and Lars. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And you know what? Same thing in the Foo Fighters camp, right? Ultimately, one person has to. Everyone can come up with all these great ideas, but ultimately, it's someone's decision, right? So, um, out of the stock, the stock sounds of Metallica, I think it's been the best that I've heard in a long time. Uh, but yeah, that's, there's a lot of music critics I've listened to on YouTube and they said the same thing where it sounds like it's just a stock. It's like a, a Metallica inspired band creating a song, but not Metallica. Um, I didn't like his, his voice. I don't like the voice, but I liked the riff. The riffs were good. And the double, the double kick was great. I'm actually kind of more excited about, not that I can plan on going, their tour uh, set up and what their strategy is. It's basically a weekend pass for every ticket you buy. Metallica plays two shows. So they come to every city, say they come to Toronto in our neck of the woods. Uh, they play two shows and one ticket gets you into Friday and Sunday. And it's like a no repeat weekend. So different songs each night, different set lists, which is pretty cool. So it's probably going to be like old and new, I would imagine. So go Friday, yeah. stay home. For Jay. Yeah, I saw him in 96. Lollapalooza. Yeah. yeah. With yeah, Soundgarden. That was, that was good. You know, like the, there's too much, too much time has passed and there's too many songs that I don't like. So I don't think I would enjoy the, the show that much. You, I, you would I, think I, that. You would think that. But you're a Foo Fighter fan too. So mm-hmm. 
they've put out the same i think foos actually have more albums out now than metallica given mm. it takes metallica five years to release an album and you know when you go to a foo show you only get four songs from the latest album and the rest are all if, the oh, greatest hits that. If yeah, that, and the rest yeah. are all the greatest hits. So when you yeah. go to a Metallica album, man, or Metallica album, Metallica concert, you you might get the two singles and maybe you know uh, a deeper track that like rocks that the fans are responding to, like the hardcores. But then it's you know Ride the Lightning, it's Seek and Destroy, it's yeah. Master Puppets, it's One, it's Blackened, it's Justice for All, half of the Black album, and maybe one song from Load or Reload. And right there, there's two hours, you know? Yeah. I think it's it's one of those bands I'm glad I crossed off the list. But again, I, I would have no... I mean, maybe if they came to our city, maybe. But no. even then... I'm good. I, 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 I like Metallica a, a lot. But I'm good with a lot of their new stuff. It's just not speaking to me the way that it used to. And I hope yeah. it speaks to somebody else. A lot of people got excited with stranger things and master puppets tying into that. So there's probably a whole new fan base of teenagers that are responding to that music because unlike film and TVs, and this is the thing that I've really been thinking about lately. unlike film and TV shows, music doesn't age in the same way. You can go back and listen to Zeppelin. You can go back and listen to Sabbath and the Beatles and a good song is a good song. It doesn't feel dated in the same way that an old movie can feel dated or an old video game might feel dated. Yeah. Yeah. I would agree with that statement for sure. Um, and some of the stuff um, like Nirvana, Nevermind to me, I guess because we grew up with it, but when I listen to it, it still feels like it's a new, yeah. it sounds new to me. Like it sounds like a new music as in like breaking, uh, breaking new ground kind of music. That's probably just my nostalgia love for it, but no, it's fresh. I mean, certainly um, compared to other stuff, it still feels like it stands head and shoulders above everything that's come after it. I mean, to get to, to be fair, most bands, most of these legacy bands, welcome to the music podcast, by the way, everyone, <laughs> most this of ties these, into pop culture. This is, this is history. This is whether it's toys, music, movies, sure. TV, this fits most of the legacy bands. I don't know if you agree with me, but this is just how I think. The later stuff doesn't do it for me. Uh, you know, like Pearl Jam 10 versus really great. And then it kind of fades off for me. I'm not saying it's bad music, but it's not the same. Like, I'm not like the first one to throw on no code, right? Like, it's not my thing. Same with Chili Peppers. <laughs> you had to Blood say Sugar, no code. You, you just, couldn't say any other album. You couldn't say, was it Yield? Yield, no code. Uh, the other one. <laughs> and any one of their 60 live albums? The Pro Pearl 100. Jam from 2006, just called Pearl Jam, is really good. But yeah, I find as they go on, and you know, Foo Fighters isn't perfect. My favorite band's not perfect. Um, they put out some records that have not been so great, like uh, Concrete Gold. Concrete and Gold. I still have a really difficult time getting through the whole thing. But there you go. I mean, the death. Yeah, but every now and then, so a great. band that we get into early on in their career. Even if they have one or two misfires, every now and then, down the road, they do drop something that feels just like their new stuff or enough like it, plus enough with what they want to get into that it's like, ah, oh, finally, back to back to basics. What are your yeah. favorite examples of that? Well, I would say this new Metallica song is a, a perfect tie-in back to that. I think it sounds... Uh, again, except for James, and I understand him wanting to change his vocal style. The problem with that is he's been a certain way up until the Black Album, you could argue, and then he changed his sound, which is fine, but Whoa he lost me with that. I have no problem with the guy wanting to sing differently, but um, that being said, I would say the new Metallica, but man, I've tried. Like, <clears throat> Have you heard the new Chili Peppers that came out this year? couple of the songs no i stopped chili pepper stuff with stadium arcadium which is like 2005 dude it's it's not for me i'll just say that it's not for me and uh yeah i, I can't really think of a lot of bands maybe that 2006 pearl jam album because that got me back into them it, it's they just went so mellow right yeah they went commercial and well green day american idiot 2005 after one yeah, for sure day. yeah there's a few of those I didn't and then know. revolution radio five years yeah. ago was a great album although their last album father of all mother truckers 
not a great is that the one that effort. there's three records no that's uno dos tray which is also a great effort but they didn't tour that at all because that's when he went into rehab oh okay so they had like two singles on the radio for like 36 songs or something yeah it was just like full stop which was sad much like so many toys that when these lines just keep going, what are we going to get from them? When are we going to get, or at least brands, when are we going to get something fresh? that doesn't feel, and this is what we talked about with the black series, right? Like when is it going to get fresh again? And I want to talk to you about a, a hot take on the black series that was introduced by our friends at toy power podcast. But first we got to get to the open. Welcome back to the Jay and Rob Toy Show. Joined alongside Jay Bartlett, of course. I am Rob McCallum. And clearly, we're talking a, about a lot of different things today. Our viewing statistics and our listening statistics say you dropped off about eight minutes ago, especially since we're not talking about toys, and that's what you're here for. But if you are one of the diehard listeners and viewers out there, all three of you, we appreciate you on this listening party journey. Well, I think there's nothing wrong with combining everything that that we love no i don't think no jay that. we've talked about this for episodes one thing one show one person that's, that's it that's it one so love. we gotta do so for music for games and then for toys we have to do three and, different podcasts and then movies and then maybe movies. a whole other one for movie trailers and yeah. you know what toys might even be too broad we might have to do separate ones for that too there you go i did see uh, the latest wave of action force this week. So that was kind of neat. Uh, the military, like GI Joe figures from Valvers. Yes. Yeah. What do you think of those? <laughs> they, they were cool. They were slaughter. They're, yeah. Slaughter was there. Cool. They're more military looking than Joe's like your, your standard military. But again, they just didn't, they didn't do it for me. Slaughter looked pretty cool though. Yeah, I, I have a hard time comparing Classified Slaughter to Valver Slaughter. They're yeah. both really good for really different reasons. Speaking of which, we had a number of people after Action Figure Spotlight last week when I showed Serpentor in the box messaging to see Serpentor. So there you go. There he is out of the box. Woo uh, look, and the cape is not brittle and it actually has a scale like pattern on the back, which is cool. So there he is. He comes with two heads too, which I didn't know about, which is fantastic. Uh, this is more like the vintage style where there's a separation between the helmet and the cowl. So that's not the one that comes on the box. I love separation of the helmet and the cowl. <sighs> that's what uh, that's what got us through high school. Um, I, I have several icebreakers for you, my friend, before we get okay. into some hot takes inspired by our friends down under from Australia. First icebreaker. You have a chance to go through an ever-living toy store. Okay, so this isn't like a toy store in the 80s. Or 70s one. This is an ever-living toy store that has an aisle dedicated to each uh, IP. Oh, cool. What aisles do you hit up knowing you could only see five? So this will have the contents of everything up until this day? That's right. So you'll have a Star Wars aisle and have everything. And... Are the prices for these aisles like today's prices? We're not talking prices? about prices. We're just talking about what five aisles do you want to go down and see? Almost like a museum exhibit. Just what I want to see? What do you want to go see and what do you want to check out? I would check out probably mask first. Wow. Yeah. I would do G.I. Joe second. Okay. That's two. Oh, wow. What do I want to see? Oh, I would want to see Brave Star stuff. Yeah, okay. I want to see Brave Star That'd stuff. That would be a very short aisle, but you go ahead. Ha half an aisle. Yeah. <laughs> Whoop, done. It's an end cap. <laughs> yeah, I'm thinking. Two, I'm more. Thinking, Two more. I would like to see. Master G.I. Joe Brave Star. Like the Mego stuff would be fun to, to okay. go back and be able to see that. And now I'm not going to say Star Wars because that would be like 80 aisles. 
But let's just say superpowers for fun, because I think that'd be a nice colorful aisle. Here's the follow up. Okay. Those are the, those are the five. You have enough money to buy everything from one single aisle, or you can get half the stuff in any two aisles. That's it. What do you do? Well, if it's adding to my current collection, I would do half of two aisles. Okay. Which two would you go after? Uh, Mask and G.I. Joe. Because I think I have a pretty healthy mask collection and Joe collection. And I think if I could take half from the aisle, then that would almost complete probably a lot of it. It would be a good chunk of the work. Let's put it that way. Yeah. Right. Interesting. So no Star Wars. None. <laughs> no. <laughs> and no Masters. I was surprised. I thought for sure you'd want to just see the Masters. We've seen a lot. I've seen too much. <laughs> <laughs> I am good. Masters of the Universe is like Metallica. It was great when it was in the 80s. <laughs> I know it's it's great now, but... It, Except for it just feels like a leftover session from the 80s. It feels to me now... Like Star Wars does. It's there's so much of it. There's so many different lines and it's everywhere all the time. So I it's not it's not I'm not saying listen, everyone. <laughs> I'm not saying hey, I don't like Masters, Masters of the really Universe. Here we go. <laughs> I'm not saying I hate Star Wars, but I've I've seen enough. Jay I'm hates two lines I need, I need one comment to miss you guys. Back uh, off. Yeah. Let me miss you for a little bit. Mm-hmm. I don't need Masters of the Universe toothbrush and toothpaste and body wash. And I'm oh, good. don't you? He, it took man. you a long time to get to that point with uh, Star Wars because Star Wars has always had that uh, paraphernalia and ancillary merchandise around. Yeah, back when George was taking care of it. Now, <laughs> such a mess that I, I just I can't even stand the sight of it right now. And so let, let's get to the hot take right now because sure. I'm curious what you what you think. Um, our friends in Toy Power Podcast, as I alluded to, had an episode about a month ago about hot takes, and and Frank's hot take was just stop the Black Series line, like just stop it. You, you've done everything, you know, every possible figure that you know. See people see you're like you're re-releasing archive figures at this point, and you're just celebrating the original trilogy release dates at this point. What more? can you possibly do like you've you've beaten a dead horse just stop the black series yeah that's not gonna happen (laughs) i mean that's right well it's a hot take right it's not supposed to be something that they actually do so i talked about this a couple episodes ago where i understand hasbro's perspective where there might be some kids now that are getting into collecting who knows but let's just say there is They've never had a Luke Skywalker. They they weren't old enough four years ago to go get a Bespin Luke. So who knows? They're not watching Luke Skywalker. They're not watching the original. Who trilogy. knows? Who knows? Th- right think about about those kids, man. Think about them. They grew up watching like the Clone Wars and Rebels and Rogue One now. Sure. And then they go from that to A New Hope. That is a jarring transition that, again, going back to our discussion of how well we can digest media from yesteryear. That is a very jarring transition to see something so slick and polished and action packed and then seeing the original trilogy unfold. That's nothing to take away from the original trilogy. Obviously, I'm a huge fan of it, as are you, as are most logical, sane people. But for kids growing up in a Star Wars universe with what is put in front of them to get them into the series and that whole franchise, it is it's a very, very big step to go back to the original trilogy. Right. Yeah. It's very calm. And that's what the Black Series is really like rel- relying on. It's not like they're doing extended universe stuff, which was one suggestion I think Scotty had from Toy Power to like, well, you can freshen up the Black Series by doing extended universe, non-canon figures, and get people excited about those deep cuts. But then would enough people know them? Would they sell enough figures? Probably not. Trent only likes to collect uh, the vintage figures. So anything that was in the original 78 line, he only yeah. wants the Black Series, you know, counterparts well i mean the problem now distribution wise for black series is you have to buy as a retailer a a case of one figure now there's no longer a wave so you're buying a case of and i I can't remember i think it's six or eight or maybe ten in a box 
And if you just want one loader droid figure from Obi-Wan TV show, too bad. You got to buy 10 of them, right? That's a real problem. So now you have all these Yikes. retailers, big corporate retailers and smaller ones having to sit on all these peg warmer figures. They're not taking any risks on new figures um, for that reason. They don't want to take any kind of loss. And I think this all comes back to price again. They can't afford to do it because they can't afford to have 20 of something sitting at Toys R Us at $40 a pop, right? Sure. But the old model when George was in charge was great. Anyone who came across the screen got an action figure and they, they were quality. So the 2000s were the best time to collect Star Wars. The, the 2000 to 2010, the best time. Yeah. I, I don't know what they got to do to make the Black Series interesting because just celebrating the films. And I see there's a new emphasis like on cloth goods more and more with every figure release yeah. there's going to be a cloth component, which I think is cool. But I know a lot of figures are figure collectors are split on the inclusion of cloth goods. If they're not good, it just looks baggy. It looks more doll like for some people. And hey, not all cloth goods are good. I love cloth goods. I showcased, I think the TMNT undercover raft figure not too long ago. And the cloth goods made that figure, the Palpatine figure that's coming out for Jedi. I don't know if it's quite nailed. It looks just like a cut off sock from a bad night at the bar. Like it just, it's just not. Yeah. Do you, do you think there's, do you think that you can be exposed to too much of that thing that you love? Oh yeah, absolutely. You can be so totally too exposed and it sour you. And that's why when origins came out, I was like, I'm good. I just don't yeah. want, I it was, it was a, it was an acidic reaction pH test to it. Like there was too much, there's too much fandom and it was overwhelming, but now that it's died down because other pockets of master stuff have come up, the collectability has become more interesting. Uh, it's, it's way more digestible for me to get into origins. And of course, now right. I've been able to have it in hand and, and see it. But yes, you can totally be over inundated with a, with something that you love and it like turn against you. Because the more you're inundated, I think, the more of the things that you, you don't love, you don't see the thing that you love. You see the other uh, the other stuff, perhaps. And Yeah, yeah, I agree. That's what's happening with, with Star Wars, I think, um, with me at least. Of course, I don't dislike Star Wars. I dislike parts of it. But I'm tired of it. And, you know, the stuff that's coming out is uh, Book of Boba Fett, uh, are some of the new figures, Obi-Wan Kenobi TV show. I cannot stand those shows. So I'm not excited about that. And then you're right. Here's another Bespin Han. Here's another Hoth Leia. I'm just I'm sick of it. And, you know, I'm going to get slammed next year because it's Return of the Jedi, which is my favorite. And it's going to be Luke again. Blah, 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 blah. And I'm just, yeah, I'm just tired of it. It's not exciting. And then just to know that Hasbro will release a really cool figure and then five years re-release it like Darth Revan completely yeah. devalue the original figure because they put it in archives. Uh, so what are they going to do to shake it up to get you interested? What would be one thing that Hasbro could do within the Black Series to get you interested in about buying something more routinely? One thing I was really interested in when The Force Awakens came out with the 3.75 inch line was, you know, when we're watching the movie in the theater, it's like all like uh, Maz's bar, for instance, all the amazing creatures that they created. We saw maybe two of them. So I want to see some of those background characters. Star Wars is so big. And yet when, when George sold it, the marketing team now at Disney, it's in Hasbro, it's just so small. So it's just core characters. And I don't know if that's just because people don't care about those background characters, but the two thousands were certainly uh, lucrative with all that kind of stuff. It was everywhere and they sold. There, there was a few figures yeah. that were peg warmers here and there, but they all sold, man. I, I think to go hand in hand with that, my suggestion and, and I, when it comes out, there's going to be haters or disagreeers and, but, but I think there's a way to, I, I think you need play sets, but I don't think you need like big elaborate, you know, Masters Universe classic Snake Mountain level play sets. I think you could get away with a lot of cardboard backdrops and, and a few plastic pieces to help kind of anchor a scene. So you have Maz's bar. If you just have a diorama of the backdrop and, and, and a, in, in a way, like basically just a slice of that world to give you something to fill. So you take your idea of these deep cut characters, but then you provide a home for them. And let's look at the diorama success that we've seen 
over the last few years. Yeah. We've seen Eternia, uh, TMNT. There's been a few different NECA ones. You have the street top scene, of course, and now they're looking at the lair diorama that's coming out as well. That's a pretty cool thing. A- every time a playset comes out, people get excited. That's the bottom line. So if you could make an affordable playset, even if it's backdrop based, which has that vintage callback, I think there's a lot of love to do there. And then you give something for people to collect and they'll go, I got to fill this up. I got to get this. I got to get this. You know what? Give me a subscription based pre order method again where it's a figure a month. I want Maz's bar. That's what we're doing this year. Or Jabba's, even if it's Chaba's Palace or the Cantina on Mos Eisley, you well, start with the backdrop and every month you get a new figure that goes in it. Whatever, whatever it is. But I think just a cardboard backdrop with some key pieces would be a good way to anchor something new and get people excited about collecting again. That's good in theory, but all you're going to get is original trilogy and maybe prequel stuff. Now you'll never get sequel trilogy stuff. Uh, That stuff was such a colossal failure and that's really too bad because again, I'm tired of buying the cantina. I'm tired of this stuff. And you know, is it their fault that I've collected it my whole life? No, but that doesn't mean I have to keep rebuying this stuff. We'll never see Maz's bar. All that great stuff we got in the 2000s. I suggest everyone now who is a Star Wars fan, go back and start collecting that stuff. You would be amazed at the vehicles and the figures they made for that line. They'll blow you away. Just blow yeah. you away. We'll they, never they see went, that stuff. We'll never they see They went it. all in with the uh, 3.75. They made every, everything, every yeah. vehicle, everything. It's great. This is a follow-up uh, question to, sure. to the ice to the icebreaker. My five aisles would be Masters, TMNT, uh, Transformers, Joe, and Superpowers, and I would probably uh, split it between Masters and Superpowers. Get those. I don't think I would want all the turtles or even half of them. And it'd just be cool to see Joe and Transformers. Follow-up icebreaker: When you think of all toy history, and want you listen to this carefully, what was the best five-year period to be a collector? Consider quality of figures that were out, price of figures, and availability of figures. To be a collector, not to be a kid in the 80s, because frankly, we're kids and not collectors at that point. When was the best time to be a collector? So do we have to count when we were adults or can we go back as an adult? No, no, no. As an adult collector. So basically, for you and I, it would be any time after, say, like 97. Sure. What's been the best five-year period? I guess in the last 25 years. I mean, you could argue if you were a collector in the eighties, like an adult collector who grew up with maybe GI Joe in the sixties, and now you're collecting stuff in the eighties, that would be a good period. But I, I kind of mean you and me. If you were an adult collector in 1985 would be you like, that's the year, right? Um, as an, I mean, we got back into it 2000, 2001. And again, we talk about Todd McFarlane a lot, but he's a visionary and he changed the way toys were marketed and made. They were made now for us. They weren't made for kids. We didn't have to be so embarrassed going into Walmart, right? And looking at the toy aisle in our 20s. He changed that, man. And the movie Maniacs, and, and, and you know, for, for us too, it was the Kiss figures he released, Alice Cooper, Ozzy Osbourne, all that stuff. I think that was really exciting. That's so. That's the biggest. So what? Ninety eight, ninety nine, uh, two thousand four. Uh, that's the best time t- so, in your life to be an adult collector. It's five years. So I'll say ninety five to two thousand because ninety five is when Star Wars came back, and that okay. was insanity. I'll say ninety five to two thousand. Yeah. Then we get McFarlane, and then we get the Star Wars uh, re-release. I couldn't come up with a definitive like time period that beat any other period. But the one I kept going back to was 2006 to 2011. Mm. Because you get a lot of the NECA stuff. You get a lot of the reboots happening for all the shows that we love. So there's still retail stuff, but there's still, it's adult collector oriented, even if it's not specifically marketed at first. Yeah. And you also get the beginning of Masters of the Universe Classics in 2008, 2009. And you get all those great DC figures as well from Four Horsemen. And there's a lot of Turtle stuff at the same time. And of course, the best, my favorite Star Wars collecting stuff, which is 2007, the 30th year anniversary stuff where you get um, the Falcon, right? That awesome. The legacy stuff. The legacy stuff. Yeah. yeah. So that is is a real big sweet spot where it's, 
there's still an overlap between here's a retail release for everybody, but we're just starting to kind of market and separate stuff for adult collectors on mass, not just a one off, you know, kind of release like they did in 2002 with the He-Man figures, right? Or, yeah. 2002 with the commemorative. There's right. like, Right. It becomes a full-on bubble now, not just a, a stunt. It's 2006, 2007 to 2011, somewhere in there. I yeah, I don't think you can lose either way. Both both our answers are the correct answers, and that is the final word. <laughs> uh, for, speaking for sure. of, I mean, speaking of correct answers and correct decision, I mean. Every time's a great time to be an adult collector, except for now, right? That's what every toy collector always says. When you're in it, in the moment. I mean, in five years, we could look back and say, oh, wow, we got it real good. I would much rather have the problem of not being able to find anything that we seem to have had for obvious reasons a few years ago than the cost of things. I would much rather have that problem. So I I would say, yeah, now is it's there's a lot of great stuff out there. Sure. There's also your platinum credit card coffin (laughs) waiting for you. (laughs) Chrome credit card debt. (laughs) Sealed. Speaking of uh, best time to be a collector in those toy aisles, you picked some really outlier non big four, big five IPs with Brave Star and Mask. What uh, what did you think of Action Figure Adventure Episode 7? I guess specifically the discussion segment in which we talked about lesser known toy lines. Yeah, it was really great. I can't remember who said it, um, but they talked about you know, the eighties was such a gold mine and you had to have to, to market a successful toy line. You had to have media with it. So it would be the cartoon or the comic book or both. If you're like GI Joe transformers, you had both. And then you were like a mega, mega power. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, it was like the wild West and the success of stuff like GI Joe masters of the universe, all the toy companies behind them were just like, well, let's try this. A uh, secret agent with a mask and he has a transforming vehicle. Like, just like, you know what I mean? Let's take Transformers, G.I. Joe, uh, James Bond. We'll throw it all together. Here's another toy line. Uh, yeah. Subterranean monsters and scientists that go after them. Sure. Let's take uh, Ghostbusters and monster movies and boom, here's another one. Amazing. Yeah. And a lot of I, what I love is a lot of people that we interviewed. Every Everybody had like that niche line that they liked. You know, so... Yeah. You don't just ever like the big ones. There's always an ancillary line that has those little components, those little features that really scratch at you that you can't let go, even though on the surface, you know, it's not as big as Star Wars or Joe or Transformers. And that's kind of cool too, though, right? Because then it's, it's less common, but it's not as sought after. So if you do go to toy cons or, you know, toy stores and stuff, you might have a better chance of finding this because it's not as sought after as Star Wars or one of the big ones, right? Yeah. Say Star, Star Wars. <laughs> oh, Star Wars. <laughs> uh, I, I think there's a, a an interesting personal connection too with a lot of the, the lesser known smaller lines. Like Pixel Dan talks about how he loves food fighters. Yeah. Which obviously is a little bit of a spin or a pivot off TMNT, right? Like sure, yeah. food that's military. It's like, it's like Ninja Turtles meets GI Joe, but with food and those figures are really cool and it's interesting, but you can see why it didn't have, you know, the legs or the sauce to, to really go the distance. Like those other brands, like yeah. it's neat for what it is, but okay. The joke's over. Two, two interesting lines. I often like to talk about our black star. And how Black Star's cartoon came out in 1981, right? Mm-hmm. And it was good. Sure. Goes off the air. There's only 12 episodes done. And then He-Man takes off. And then the He-Man cartoon comes out. So it was the opposite where He-Man had the toys first and then they had the cartoon. And then <laughs> the Black Star is like, uh, I think it's Galoob. They're like, well, we can make barbarian figures too. And then they brought it out way after two years is a lifetime for a kid. So yeah. they brought out Black Star figures two years after the cartoon had done a colossal failure, right? No one cared. And the same with Brave Star, how the cartoon came out almost a year and a bit after, and that just killed the toy line. So it really shows in the 80s that perfect marketing magic with the cartoon or the movie and the toy. One needed the other. And Black Star, I mean, it's a cool show and it's by filmation, and there's a lot of fans, a, and a lot of similarities. 
it's all it's right. a cool show there's a there's a lot of a lot of interesting elements that were introduced there and i think later perfected in other shows and other comic like, like the two sword halves right like that's yeah. a great concept mm -hmm. Uh, but I think the problem is when you come out with a toy line two years later and it's and Masters is dominating the barbarian fantasy space, you better have a figure that's as good or better since you don't have a cartoon to compete with. Like it better jump off the shelf. And when you look at John Blackstar, it looks so stiff compared to like a He-Man, which is just yeah. like begging to be wrestled and played with. Yeah, the pose of Blackstar. And we were talking about this on my channel last last weekend. Uh I want to like that figure and as much as I don't like remakes. That's a series that I'm begging for them to redo the figures because I think black star, they definitely need it. I mean, he can barely even hold his sword. The like sword is the coolest accessory. The, the sword's great. Um, the story is good. I like the Travits and all that stuff. It's, it's good. It's not nearly as good as he man, but I still enjoy it. But the figures are so bad. They're so I've terrible. Seen I've seen incredible customs of Black Star yeah. done with Brave Origins Star. figures. Brave Star ones too. Uh, I haven't seen any Brave Star custom. Although our, our friends at Ramen Toy, who do a lot of these illegal third-party licensing uh, stuff, like they have the Gullwing door, you know, the reboot of Thunderhawk. Yeah. They have that coming out, and they have uh, what are they the calling? Centurions. They have the Centurions, which I did pick up. They have they call the great. I think it's Great White is what they're calling Shark. For their mask release yeah um yeah. trying to think of the other ones but they have the marshall coming out oh they had a quicksilver one too that was licensed that was actually officially oh, licensed. Licensed. okay yeah but the funny part about that license is it looks way better than what we're getting from super seven i don't know what's up with super seven lately buddy but i i'm not uh -oh. i'm not happy Tales from Super percent. Seven. What what happened? What's the latest thing? Oh, just seeing the latest waves of uh, you know I'm a big fan of Thundercats Ultimates. Seeing the latest mm -hmm. two waves, I haven't picked up any of them. I let them go because I looked at the paint apps. I don't know what's going on. Are they're just terrible? They're, they're so bad, and the figures that they just feel different. I keep saying and, that every episode. And the price has gone twenty five dollars higher. Yeah, that's that's a that's lot of money, hard. man. Sixty four ninety nine Canadian. Um, I could I could justify it in the fact that these are special. We don't get them too often. Um, you know, I'm on board with them and I really enjoyed them. And then as the waves came out, they just seemed to get they felt cheaper. The latest wave I did with Chitara, they just they didn't feel as good. Um, and then they jacked them up to eighty nine ninety nine. It's I can't do that. So, yeah, I mean what's up with Super Seven? I keep saying I'm done with the Super 7 TMNT Ultimates. Like, it's like a real pick and choose now. And I've let entire waves go by and wave multiple waves go by. And it's only if I find it locally will I, will I pick one. Like, the only one that I'm really looking at is Leatherhead. Yeah. But I'm not sold on, on the Leatherneck. The face. Leather, leatherneck. Yeah. Yeah. Leatherneck. That's right. With what's his name? <laughs> <laughs> Have you seen the Super 7 Ultimates? transformers yes not a, not like up close dude they're so bad i'm they're i had so them pre-ordered i'm glad i don't they're they're terrible the ghost of starscream he looks like a little baby toy like, looks like it, a sugar it, pop doesn't he it almost looks like a like a funko figure I uh, and then I actually, it looks like a piece of candy like a fruit by the foot that has like sugar on it Yes, and the proportions are so weird. The head is giant, and it's not the art style. Just whoever sculpted it, it's terrible. The head is giant, and I mean, Optimus Prime looks okay. And then I got my hands um, on the, I think it was a San Diego Comic-Con exclusive G.I. Joe Ultimates bat. I got to okay. take a look at it. It's just like a different color blue. It's the comic book color or whatever. Again, terrible. $90. <sighs> You see, I have Cobra Commander from their cartoon Ultimate Lines pre-ordered. Yeah. I'm on the fence because I want a good Cobra Commander figure. I don't like classified Cobra Commander. I want Cobra Commander from the cartoon show, right? And yeah. the Ultimates one comes with the, the black and red cape. It comes with the, you know, the Serpent Scepter. Like That's what you kind of want for a Cobra Commander fan. But I am so hesitant and skeptical about what this thing might be. Like I might just keep my pre-order on Big Bad Toy Store. And once the reviews come out, if people are saying it's trash, I'll just give it back to Big Bad for store credit because what's the point, you know? Well, again, it's like we're getting bombarded. Here's another IP we can add to that list. G.I. Joe. So much G.I. Joe. 
right? And well, it's like it's it's too much. It's too much. That's what they said in the eighties too, Jay. And now we have diehard collectors that are focusing brother, on a real brother, American. We hero. had real American hero. That was one line. And there was so much. Okay, so here's a question. Would you rather have one line that you're over in, inundated with one line that you can't keep up with? Or would you rather have multiple lines where you only have a little bit for each line to, to get? It was the third never, icebreaker of the show. I don't think it was ever, ever the point that you were supposed to get everything for G.I. Joe. I think what was great about Joe is that they released one wave no, no, a year. No. Collect one them all was right on the back. Come on. It said collect them all and you showed you all the things. Like They were enticing you to get everything. That's impossible. But still, one wave a year I can deal with. So that was like, what? I'm just guessing. I don't know the exact number. Like 12 figures maybe a year. Right? That's... I don't know. Boom. There you go. You have a whole year to get the figures and you would get a couple vehicles if you're lucky and maybe a playset for Christmas or something like that. It was perfect. You didn't have four or five different lines and that's what i'm talking about is even with he-man there's too many lines now it's just too much of that thing it's like you remember the marketing craze of the phantom menace you remember how everything you know you'd buy like a <laughs> box of red and black apples i don't know why i said that you'd buy, box you buy a box of apples phantom you buy, menace you apples go, you go and you buy darth maples and it would have darth maul lines you know what i mean it was everywhere that's what every ip is like now Everything is covered with everything, and it's just, it's too much. I can't remember the last time I had a box, box of, of Darth apples. Mapples. The Darth Mapples. Laugh, <laughs> Marge. <laughs> laugh. Uh, I want to talk about something that has started to becoming a trend. We said three years ago we debated brick and mortar versus online as a way to collect, and almost universally, most collectors always end up saying, "Well, online's the way to go." Because you don't have to race around the city looking for that one figure that might get put in a, in a box of figures, racing to the back of the store, hoping to find it. But now, especially with stuff like COVID and the pandemic delaying shipping and whatnot, we've seen a number of at least mom and pop level, you know, uh, do-it-yourself entrepreneur collectible stores go under. And people lose a lot of their money on this pre-order system in which they have to wait for multiple multiple years of their life before yeah. they get their figure and thousands of dollars held up uh with sometimes no no foresight or no no uh way to to make amends with bankruptcy is online collecting still the way to go is the pre-order system still the best bet The only one I've seen that does it with any degree of success is Big Bad Toy Store. They're gigantic, right? So it's different. Um, they have a no penalty policy because they're big enough to be able to, to to take that hit. That's fine. You know, if you order the bat from GI Joe, and they're like, okay, shipping notice. You know, in two days, this will ship. We're going to charge your card in two days. And then you're like, ah, I don't really want that. Cancel. Okay. Imagine 10 or 20 people do that. They have 20 extra bats. That's not even going to hurt them. They don't. That's fine. But, and I know, I think I know this story you're talking about. We're not going to name names here, but I think I know. The There's several. I mean, I heard about it more than anything from our friends in Australia. I'm on yeah, like a binge with Toy Power Podcast. And they've got hit with three or four stores in the last year. Of course, yeah, there's one. It's not just Australia. There's tons in, in Canada too. Yeah, sure. So those little guys, I mean, I, f I feel so bad for them. Um, I, I think you can't blame anyone, but the toy companies, they're, they're the ones doing it. They're the ones marketing this stuff years ahead of time. And look at Hasbro when they do their Hasbro releases, they'll show a CG mock up of the figure. But even crazier than that, they'll just do, I forget what they call it. It's a name. It's a, basically a name drop. We got three names we're going to give you guys. We don't have any art mock-up or anything, but Snow Serpent. And they'll just say it into the mic. They have no art. They have nothing. So they have that level. Then they have the CG mock-up. And you yeah, know the when they show Falcon, it's going to be a year from when they show Falcon. Yeah. Why do we need to know so far ahead? And because Super we need, we constantly worst. need to know. We constantly need to know. We want the next new thing. information. Don't worry, it's everyone. Never enough. You're gonna want to buy more stuff. That's all you need to. You know that's gonna happen. Because right? if I, I mean, tell you now about Falcon, and then I get your money now for the next two years. That's why. Yeah. Well, that's that's killing the mom and pop stores. Clearly, 
it's killing them because people are throwing down money and then they're getting mad. And I know this firsthand from a few of them that have gone under, unfortunately, they're calling these stores. Oh, where's my Falcon? It's like, dude, Falcon is like, it's just being produced in the factories. Oh, well, I pre-ordered that six months ago. Yeah. Well, that's not the game or that the game retailer. That's not the toy retailer's fault. Yeah. But they're getting hit the hardest and they can't survive that. So they're getting an abundance of cancellations. They're hemorrhaging money and you know, people aren't compensating. It's not like they're canceling the bad and buying Sergeant Slaughter or whoever's they're not doing that. They're just canceling. Do you think online is the way to go, but is it just going to be with the bigger stores like big bad and entertainment earth? which are really the only two big online stores I can think of. Unless yeah. maybe you consider like buying direct from like NECA or Super 7 because they produce it, so they should have it. Yeah, you can... you can Or Mattel. The companies themselves, Mattel, Hasbro, whatever. You can buy from the big retailers, Amazon, Walmart, Big Bad Toy Store. The mom and pop shops just can't do it. But going to them and shopping in person, obviously you can't do that with big bad toy store. So it's more exciting still to be in person, but I think everything is headed online and I think everything is headed strictly f- to these three or four big companies. Um, that's the future, whether we like it or not, that's just the reality of what's happening. That's for everything, man. That's for toys. That's for video games. That's for all this stuff that we like, all the pop culture geek stuff we like. Yeah, I don't know. I'm going to do my window gaze and gaze out into the beautiful core of downtown dilapidated Gotham London. City. Do Gotham I want City. it to be the way it was in 2000, 2001? Yeah, of course I do. Of course I do. There's nothing like going into a mom and pop game store. And Lord knows through Nintendo Quest and Action Figure Adventure, we've seen so many great ones. Yeah. that Nothing beats that. Nothing will ever beat that. But there's a game retailer and I'm not going to name names again. There's a game retailer in our town here that we know very well that has done extremely well, but the only reason they're still around is because the big corporate game store doesn't carry retro games. Otherwise they'd be sure. gone. Right. That's just the reality. It's yeah. But. I, I'm optimistic. What I mean, this is the same thing with toy stores too, right? If you have a huge vintage selection, then you'll always have a, a vintage audience coming in so that the yeah. dependency on new stuff, like, I guess it really depends on your business model. I'm optimistic that there's still room for mom and pop stores, but I think it means companies like Mattel and Hasbro that have embraced the direct to consumer model and eliminated the middleman of a Toys R Us and some of these other chains. They've become accustomed to these higher profit margins. And I think that in order to, feed the audience they have to cut some of those profit margins to allow the mom and pop physical stores to to have these again the mom and pop stores do not get first pick at anything they're oh yeah i know it all has to change so it's like a new wave of whatever will be announced dude they're last right so it's walmart toys r us they get i'll take 12 cases of obi-wan and then the mom and pop stores get like the loader droid that's all that's all that's left so well, thank these God I like are, loader droids. Do you know what I mean? Like they get the the peg worm yeah. or whatever you want to call. It. I can't remember his name. I think it's Ned. I think it's Ned. I think that's Ned the, the loader droid. I think I think he's from Andor. The loader droid Ned. No, he's. I not, don't he's know. One, but I don't yeah. know. And anyway, if Jordan, if you're listening, I apologize, but I haven't watched Andor. I'm. Anyway. You know, I'm surprised. I'm, I'm going to touch on this in a second because Andor is the most critically. Uh, a critically success of all the Star Wars shows, even more than Mandalorian. It's got such amazing reviews across the board that Disney is even taking it off of Disney Plus and sharing it on ABC Broadcasting and Hulu because it has been that well received across the board. And I know you've shared some mixed feelings about how you've uh, traversed the first couple episodes of Andor. I've watched episode one and I absolutely loved it so far. Mm. I know there's several episodes to go, but I have heard only amazing things uh, that it's an awesome show first and foremost, and the and the and the fact that that it has to do with Star Wars is second or third on the list. Jordan says it's you know Breaking Bad in space. It is that good. It is, and it no is that Breaking Bad, but it's well. You and Jordan can can have a, at least a one episode debate about the uh, the incredible nature of Andor. It's like. 
picture, if you will, you're a single guy. Okay. God forbid you should go on these dating apps. And it's like over the course of a couple of years, you've gone on a ton of these dating app dates and they've all Mando. horrific and they've scarred Boba you. Fett. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. That's where I'm at with Andor. I'm not saying it's a bad show. I just, I don't have it in me at this particular moment in well, my life to, to go what? on another ride with Star Wars. This is fine. I, I'm honestly in the same boat. I watched Boba Fett every week. I'm sorry I watched it every that. week, even I'm though sorry. I didn't like it. I, I couldn't miss the week, tr- the weekly train wreck. I couldn't do it. I had to see how bad it was. So bad. You know, like uh, my partner, Tanya, big Star Wars fan, like Star Wars is one of our, our couples thing. And she bowed out of Boba Fett because it was so bad. And I still had to keep going back to the well to drink that poison water. Oh, God. But Andor came and it just felt like, oh, that's OK. I'm, I'm just not in the space for another show, like another weekly commitment when it dropped. So, again, the lovely nature of streaming and binging, I can take my time with it. And I love that there, it hasn't been like about spoilers or anything, which to me tells me it's not a big it's not about big critical story hooks and big reveals because obviously it takes place before Rogue One, which is before A New Hope. So it's not like they're going to change the Star Wars galaxy, but it feels to me, it signals that it's about much more character development and drama and stakes, which is what, what all great television is made out of. So I look forward to the time that I can, you know, take that in and enjoy it without the weekly pressure and the hubbub surrounding it. Yeah, and I've I've noticed too online there isn't that weekly. Oh, did you see what happened on Andor? I really don't see any of that. I only got great. it for the finale. It was like, oh, what a great finale and what an awesome mid credit sequence. Yeah. But no spoilers. Yeah. But everybody generally praising it, and I was so surprised sure. when I saw Disney said that they're going to put it on ABC for a marathon over the Christmas holidays and put it on Hulu just to further expand that series. Like they didn't even do it with Mando, like what you would have thought with, you know, everything with baby Yoda, they would have kind of pushed it everywhere, but they didn't. So that it, it's got to be doing well enough for them to really want to share it that much more. No. And I, I mean, these companies and, and Disney's had some big growing pains with star Wars and I'm not one of these people that like I, you do, you cross me dirty. I never forgive you. In fact, I'm the opposite. <laughs> I've just, I just had a point dirty. With, with Disney Star Wars, right? Where it's like, I just, I need a break. I just cross me dirty. It's the name yeah. of our you next album. Say, you buddy. can say, you know what? There's a Luke Skywalker show coming out. Mark Hamill's going to be in it. It's going to be Adventures of Old Luke. Whatever. I would <laughs> still be like, I just need a break, man. It's from all these friggin' <laughs> Tinder app dates over the last two years, and I've just been abused. And the Tinder app is Star Wars, so. Yeah. <laughs> Do you want Star Wars? Then call me maybe. You know that yeah. song? That's what that reminds me of. Call me yeah. dirty. <laughs> Do you want Star Wars? Star Wars then call me dirty. Me dirty. Uh, like that travesty that was Obi-Wan. Get, just get it. I didn't mind it. It wasn't nearly as bad as you made it out to be. I but then again, I go into this not caring to begin with. I don't have a vested interest. It's Star Wars is not my religion. Um yeah, I like Ewan McGregor probably too much, and that makes so much forgivable. I didn't think it was great. It the more I think about it, the less I like. So I'm happy just to consume it and move on without a second thought. It's like a chocolate bar, that's, right? No, you chew that's... a Mars bar or like a Milky Way if you're in the U.S. We call it Mars bar in Canada. It tastes so good in your mouth. But when you swallow that Mars bar, it's like oh, gut rot. And that's what Obi Wan is. It's a bunch of gut oh. rot, but I focus on the chewing and the taste bud sensation of that caramel and chocolate whizzing around my mouth, flossing my teeth with sugar. That's Disney's motto: "Don't think, just consume." <laughs> Literally, don't think, consume, buy, watch, die, yeah. and s- sleep and die with your Chrome credit card debt coffin. I think there was a couple months too when I didn't watch Disney Plus, and I still got dinged the twenty bucks, and that was also I was just like, oh, I can't. Can't I can stop? Can't. Stop. Speaking of old man adventures, uh, Indiana Jones Five the trailer dropped, and uh, second trailer for Super Mario Brothers the movie produced by Illumination with Universal had come out. And I wanted to see you know kind of separate these two trailers from all the other ones that we'd mentioned at the top of the show. Uh, you watched both of them, correct? Yeah, I did. Which yeah. one do you want to discuss first? Uh, I did a reaction video that's coming out later after for- this. Drops after this drops for Indiana Jones. Okay. Um, not a reaction my first time, but I just kind of go through the trailer and talk about it. 
Uh, well, nothing in depth because I want people to make sure that they can tune into your channel on YouTube. Yeah, and yeah, full reaction. Yeah. But but gut gut reactions, and if you want more, folks, go check out Jay's channel for uh, yeah, that's critical. I will say it, it was positive. Uh, I mean, I wasn't. I don't want to give too much away from my video, but I didn't have that feeling of dread. Uh, so I mean that that's a good thing. I, I mean, I'm just I'm a little distanced from this stuff now. Uh, in its importance in my life. Do you mm. know what I mean? Like, it's not where like 20 You're growing up. You're growing up, Jay. No, it's the Tinder. It's the Star Wars Tinder <laughs> app. It beat me so badly and abused me so much that I'm just uh, like, I don't, you know, if it's good, great. If it's not great, I'm still going to exist. I've and, been this way for 20 years and it's been so lovely not to care. Yeah. And I mean, with the, with the fiasco that was the sequel trilogy of Star Wars and the TV shows, this is just where I am with these IPs now. So am I going to see it? Of course. Of course I'm going to see yeah. it. It's Indiana Jones. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I mean, I liked it. It's everything you'd expect from an Indiana Jones trailer. The first one, at least, where it's just action, the returning characters, a little sense of story and atmosphere. It's very similar to the Crystal Skull trailer. I'd be interested to see you compare those two. Um, you get that lovely street scene in 1969 where Indy's walking across the street, which reminds me just like him walking up to the greaser cafe, that nice yeah. big wide shot. And a lot of the, again, car chase scenes that are in every Indiana Jones, the horse stuff, only a little bit of the supernatural temple exploration. You get obviously a little bit from the de-aging opening sequence, which of course, I don't know if you're aware of, but the opening sequence is uh, Harrison de-aged like a lot of Marvel films do as well. So that'll be the There's opening shot of him in that. With, yeah. It looks really great too. Like opening uh, preamble, like a James Bond kind of like drop in mid mission kind of thing. I like uh, the you, name too. Indiana Jones and the dirty dialer. <laughs> this is what I was going to ask you about, you know, the, the dish pin dialer. Like, what do you think about the title? Well, you know, not much. <laughs> I mean, not, not rotary not dial <laughs> dial a phone again i don't want to give anything away from what i say i say on my video but uh our buddy chops we used to call our cell phones dialers back in the old school days so i can't i can't say that word without laughing so maybe let let it sink in for a bit i mean it was all it's okay it's okay i'm glad they didn't do fate of atlantis or something that's already come out before I'm glad. it's not exciting though I mean, Dial of Destiny makes me feel like I'm playing like Twister and I'm flicking the little arrow. Dial of Destiny. Thing. Yeah. So I guess it's the sundial thing or whatever. Is it though? Be fine. I mean, it doesn't matter. Like I, I think of like, you know, uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark. Like that seems like more action packed already. Temple of Doom. You know, there's stakes. The Last Crusade. The like these are dialer. big. Even Kingdom of the Crystal Skull, like the the fact that there's a crystal skull, the Indiana yeah. Jones and the Old Man Diaper just doesn't sound like a great title, you know. Yeah. Call me dirty, Old Man Diaper. Like seriously. Um, I would say the next one on your list of trailers definitely had me pretty pumped. Super Mario Brothers. A Mario one. I and I've only did you seen do a reaction. The, or, or do you did, did you do a reaction video to that, or can we talk about this one? Yeah, I'm gonna do one. I'm gonna do one on Saturday, but we can talk about it for sure. Okay. Um, so that that one, I'll, I just I'll say right away to everyone who's listening and watching. I've only seen the second trailer. I guess there's two. I only there's watched a teaser the one, one that was much shorter. You don't get yeah. much of it. So I only saw the one, the longer one. Then I guess that's the only one I've yeah. seen. So, oh, it's, it was uh, great. I mean, it's. Probably... I love that. Go ahead. Go ahead. I love that it seems to be both an adventure movie and in all and also like where you, you literally see mario going from world to world to world like some sort of quest some sort of collection quest by the looks of it and it's a group thing it's him princess and toad uh and it's also a little bit of uh they i guess they're almost put into like the the rebels position right away because like bowser's coming in and probably taking over everything and they sneak out poor luigi gets stuck behind <laughs> gets to be Bowser's little prison lad, but uh, I like that that it's a quest through the different parts of the the Mushroom Kingdom. I like the way that they've introduced many elements from different Mario games throughout. I'm curious to see how much they lean on them. Like, is this the Mario Kart world where there's a 20 minute like pod racing scene? 
but it's done with Mario Karts. Is so it I going to be, you know, like how are they going to balance these? Like, is it Smash Brothers with Donkey Kong on that gird or like an arena? How does it all fit together? Is it, do they set it up with a big setup or is it just kind of there and we don't have to explain it and the imagination can kind of run wild? That's the balancing act that I'm trying to figure out. But I like what I see and it looks fun. Yeah, I think um, adding the different games that Mario has been involved with and that it's not just a Mario adventure. You see Mario Kart, you see Smash Brothers, uh, you see the Tanuki suit. Uh, there's all these references to all different games. Uh, and then you even see him like plumbing or it appears that he's looking at a sink, right? Like you see really everything. I think it looks great. And to all the haters that... I can't, who's doing the voice again? It's, Chris Pratt. Star Lord, who cares? Yeah. Mario says three words his whole career. Like, oh, does it sound like Charles Martinet? Who cares? Who cares? No, we gotta get hung up on it. Then Jack Black is Bowser. I thought that's friggin' amazing. Yeah, um, I'm really Luigi's excited. Luigi's got his vacuum too. Yeah, cool. I saw that his uh, Luigi's Mansion vacuum. So you can really tell that who created this actually for once in a video game movie dug up the source material. I was like, okay, so Luigi has the, he's different from Mario. Well, Nintendo has like been heavily involved, right? Like it's presented by Nintendo and illumination for well, Universal. Yeah, you could so, tell like they've, they've been intrinsically involved from the beginning. I like that. It's been so tight lipped. I like that it is animated and not some sort of live action thing. Like yep, the I Sonic agree. movies. I, th- I think the Sonic movies are great for what they are. I think for Sonic, that was the right direction to go to make a movie franchise out of that. And it, and it works for Sonic. It wouldn't work for Mario. And I really like how they set up the arc of Mario where he's overconfident and he realizes he's got to learn and take his time and work with a team and that he can't do everything, which is why I'm guessing he's in the mushroom kingdom in the first place. He thinks he can handle some sort of plumbing thing and it goes disastrous and he's got to learn to like, Hey, slow down. You don't know everything and that's okay. You will at some point. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's and Princess is badass. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know don't know what to say about that particular part of it. We'll have to see as it applies to the story. Um, well, a strong female role model is a good thing, I think, for kids rather than her being a damsel in distress. I think at some point, sure. you know, Mario might be called upon to to rescue her, like when he hasn't still hasn't learned the lesson that you've got to work yeah. together and as a result she might get captured by Bowser. That would be a really cool twist. If it reversed and Mario got captured at the end or something, and then she had to go rescue. I think that would be cool. Um, I just don't, I don't want them to change any characters too far is what I'm getting at. So obviously her being able to fight with the staff and stuff is, is a cool idea. Of course, just don't. Did she not do that in Mario RPG? Did she not do that kind of stuff in Mario RPG and paper Mario? I can't remember. I can't remember. I don't. I didn't I, I'm going to assume enough. that there's probably some precedent for their for every decision they make. I'm curious about yeah. how far the cast of characters will go. Will we get Daisy? How many of the Koopa brothers and kids are we going to see? That yeah, I mean, they've stuff. certainly thrown references to all sorts of games. Like the Tanuki suit reference is very obscure. Yeah. So. Uh, well, that suit's been in a lot of later, like more recent Mario stuff as well. Like it's in Mario Kart 8, for example. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I think it looks good. I, I don't, it's not, it's not something that's going to drag me to the theater to see, but I'll, I'll oh, watch God, it eventually no. when it oh, comes God, out. No. Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't want to be around other mouth breathers and their kids talking through something. I want to yeah. enjoy it as a grown man by myself with my 1980s childhood fully intact. That's not going to be interrupted with popcorn chewing in i don't so know call this, me this dirty the, that's how i like the opening movies. for the nintendo verse i'm calling it if this does well you, you'll see zelda you'll see metroid and then you'll see the smash brothers movie so this is the beginning of something great uh, hopefully video game movies finally getting on track um, but i love how you the trailer starts and it's red with the nintendo logo it's almost like you're booting up a switch game right away it's like nintendo it's like yeah, okay. you kind of feel better. It's like that red warm blanket on you. It's like they're like, we got you. We got you. Don't worry. So. Speaking of uh, things that make people feel comfortable, it's time to do probably a truncated version of action figure spotlight for this week. Do you have a figure to showcase? I do. 
Uh, the only figure I, I bought is a big one. I showed it in a small video I did yesterday, but I'll show it here again. I um, finally got my hands on my Daredevil. Oh, let's go big for this one. Yeah. So the blister is a little yellow, but I had a few people reach out and say they know how to get rid of that kind of thing. So that'd be cool too. Uh, maybe. That, what do you mean a little yellow? It's as orange as the logo on Secret Wars. Yeah, and because he hasn't had any air, this is very common on Daredevil. I don't know if you guys can see. Probably not. His mouth is. He's all red plastic, and they just paint the mouth right. But his his head is almost red. So that's just from the, no oxygen. I guess the paint is just melting off. Uh, this is the first time I've ever seen Daredevil in person. And I got lucky enough that he was carded. So I, I picked that up. That's pretty exciting. I mean, I've got enough Daredevils now. I'm good. Is that the last one wasn't. that you wanted to get? What's that? Is that the last Daredevil figure that you had to really get to complete your daredevil list yeah, i only have a couple of daredevils i got the mafex one which is nice i have a few legends and i got this i mean that's that's pretty good what but do you I want from this... a guy in red pajamas with a d on his chest double d baby double d i think this is the first daredevil figure that there ever was i'm pretty sure but uh it's cool it even has the goofy secret war shield there you go that's the best part of that whole line everybody has a shield <laughs> Yeah, everyone makes Captain America look like nothing. He's like, well, why am I even here? You all have shields. You don't even need me. It's like, you're right. We don't. Yeah, but Steve Rogers, you have the superhero serum. But Steve. But Steve. Steve, uh, Steve, Steve. Madden. <laughs> <laughs> We've been friends for way too long. The timing yeah. is just perfect. Um, <laughs> I've got, uh, I have a bunch of books that I got to read. I may do a small video. Uh, Toys the Time Forgot Volume 3 finally came in, which is just another treasure trove of figure lines that didn't get produced in waves of figures that got uh, pre-canceled. They're good for an Ian Hook. I uh, released a new magazine called System Gamer, which looks at a bunch of new stuff and a bunch of old retro throwbacks. It's a really cool magazine. It's available in, in physical and digital print. Um, Jay, you doing all your, your gaming streams, especially with our good friend Willie Lowe, you guys should maybe get a, a, a digital copy of System Gamer and go through it and just kind of do a reaction video to some of that stuff because I think you would really dig it. And uh, Toy Collector Magazine is out again. Blake Wright, who does Toys of the Time Forgot, I'll uh, put that out. So that's some reading that I want to do, and I'll probably do a quick kind of reading roundup at some point. But for my action figure spotlight, I got some windowless packaging, my friend. Oh, yes, my favorite. And that's for these X-Men uh, figures. So... Um, mm. These are for based on the 90s cartoon. I have Mystique and I have Morph. Now, the cool thing about this line that I just realized is they're ending it. And I say that's <laughs> cool because I don't have to uh, I don't have to collect ad nauseum X-Men characters because that show ran for five seasons and a lot of episodes and a lot of cameos. And I'm thankful that they're that they're ending it. Um, but look, you might not be able to see the actual figures, but you get a nice picture of the actual figure. On the back. So, um, no. do you know Miss? Do you know Mystique and Morph by chance? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the last figure to come out in this line is Cyclops, which I think is the best version of Cyclops because he's he looks exactly like Marvel versus Capcom Cyclops, mm. which is based on '90s animated. Um, I'll open one of these right now so you can see what it looks like. Which one would you like to see? Mystique. Mystique. You don't like Morph? If I said Morph, you you don't like Mystique? <laughs> no, I'm just asking. Morph was created for the uh, basically for the show, I believe, uh, because they needed to kill someone in episode one. Yeah, I remember. Yeah, I started watching that on Disney Plus like last summer, I think. And all all I think about when I when I see Morph is just hearing Wolverine going Morph. <laughs> it's just like uh, it's and then then everyone, going, either way, Morph. Give us a better X Man. No, you got to show everyone the tissue paper, man. It's so exciting. Look at that. So Look this at that literally dirty just, McDonald's garbage bag. Just slid out like this. There is an accessory bag. You know, can I say something about this? Um, pa this plastic free packaging. I'll allow it. I have ketchup bottles that are plastic like that are made from plant matter so why can't we get that same kind of not plastic plastic showcasing figures oh because they have to take away the plastic because it's environmentally friendly but at the same time it should reduce the packaging cost but instead they raise the price there's your but what i'm saying is it's not plastic it's actually plant matter that's been compressed 
into a plastic-like substance. So it's not plastic. Anyways, there's Mystique. She looks awesome. Cell shading. Fantastic. Actually, it's a really cool likeness. I'm surprised that her dress is built into the belt. I would have thought it would have been a separate piece. I don't necessarily like the way that that sways. It's almost like a a hula 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 kind of vibe. Um, I don't know what the accessory is, but um, the articulation it's so it's so flimsy. Like look at that. It's such a lightweight plastic that yeah. I know that this is going to have trouble standing, but I do like the sculpt and I do like the, the paint apps on it. It's not bad. I got lucky, I guess folks, when I opened it and it actually turned out to be something of quality. So uh, that's a nice subline that I like. They're all Marvel legends, of course, but uh, cell shaded for that, for that run. And at least the packaging, they, they tried to make it make sense with these. Cause it is like a VHS yeah, box. Yeah. Another yeah, VHS so. box. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's something at the very least. They're trying, but I'd still rather have it displayed so I can see it and just leave it on my shelf and feel good about myself. Where can if people they, find you, Jay? If you want to, I'm just gonna say real quick: if they put in the effort and did the VHS style differently for everyone, that would be something instead of just a generic box. They did that for the Spider-Man Carnage two pack. Did oh, you did see that? that? No. So that's on Hasbro Pulse, and I think it's on Big Bad as well now. It's for the Spider-Man line that you and I love. But uh, right. it's a it's a two pack um, of Spider Man and Carnage. So right now, right after this show, guys, jump on over to my channel. It's just Jay Bartlett, the non exorcist space wizard, just the regular toy hater, and uh, check out uh, Chad and I are doing versus GI Joe vehicles this week. So that'll be fun for us to hate all of them. I'm kidding, of course. It's eight o'clock right after this episode here. And I'm going to backdate this because this is over an hour now, but I'll make sure that everybody's got to get a five minute window to use the bathroom and get a beverage to join Jay and Chad versus. And hey, props to Chad for wanting to support my new endeavor that I got going with my partner, Tanya Rockaholic Grooming Company. Chad doesn't have any hair whatsoever. And yeah. uh, he's like, oh, man, that looks so cool. And, you know, I, Jay, you've got a beard. I've got a beard. But this is just natural small batch hair products. And it's all music theme, which is super fun mm. for us to do. And it's a good side hustle that we like and we're huge into that that whole beard world and i swear by these products because i've remember when like you and i both had like spiky hair that we'd use gel like ice and stuff yeah that alcohol shit would dry your scalp and you'd have to wash it out and then you had to be super careful so this stuff is the opposite i almost got rid of all the eczema i had on my face with these oils that we crafted ourselves and we thought well maybe other people would like to not have to spend lots of money on products that they're probably actually destroying their skin and can actually nurture their face. So this is why we did it. And we've created a bunch of fun rock scents. And my favorite is Van Hagar. I saw that. So, That's great. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. So check out Rockaholic Grooming Company if you want some cool beard products and you like rock and roll and metal and stuff. Um, yeah, till next week, everybody. Keep your home credit card debt and call me dirty. <laughs> Stay off Tinder, too. See ya, see ya, Tinder Wars. Cheers. Mm-hmm.